welcome everyone to this PIB speaker event. Today's speaker will be Jillian Hadfield. She is the director of the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. She's the Schwartz Reisman Chair in Technology and Society, Professor of Law and of Strategic Management at the University of Toronto, a faculty member at the Vecture Institute for Artificial Intelligence, a senior policy advisor at OpenAI, and a trustee of the Cooperative AI Foundation. Her current research is focused on innovative design for legal and regulatory systems, for AI and for other complex global technologies. Her current research is uh, focused on innovative design for legal and regulatory systems for AI and other complex global technologies, computational models of human normative systems, and working with machine learning researchers to build machine learning systems that understand and respond to human norms. Her book, Rules for a Flat World, um, Why Humans Invented Law and How to Reinvent It for a Complex Global, global Economy, is also available on, uh, on Audible and in print. So thanks everyone for joining us and thank you, Jillian, so much for coming here and giving a talk to, to our group. Um, with that, I'll let you take it away. All right, thanks, Cara. Hi, everybody. Really, really delighted to have a chance to talk with you all today. And I really do hope we'll, it will be a talk, a dialogue. Um, I don't know if any of you have been participating in the uh, Cooperative AI Foundation seminar series, um, but I'm going to talk about the same things there that I was talking about here. And a big piece of that was like, what does the research agenda look like here if we really think about what we need to be studying in, in cooperative uh, intelligence. So I would I would love to have a chance to talk with you about your ideas, and um, uh, anyway. So I and and also I'm very happy to have people raise questions as we go along. If it's something that I think will you know gets uh, into a deeper conversation, uh, I may uh, ask you know we'll hold it until till we get through uh, more of the presentation if that seems right. Um, but as I said, I know a number of you are thinking about cooperative intelligence. I think it's a critical, critical research agenda and that there's, uh, you know, we're, we're running around on a little lily pad right now and there's just a huge space to explore um, uh, in, in this domain. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Okay, so let me uh, get some slides going here. Let's see. It is. Okay, and all good, Cara? Good. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, so I'm going to talk about something I'm calling the foundations of cooperative uh, intelligence. And I did I did notice I did note earlier that uh, I gave a talk at, at Cooperative AI Foundation. I'm also a trustee of the AI Foundation, Cooperative AI Foundation, and uh, we either now or very soon we'll be opening up for grant applications. So that's something else to, uh, to keep in mind. Does everybody see everything okay? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so um, let me just say a little bit to start about the, the nature of the research that, that I've been doing for many years from a lot of different directions. I've been working on AI related topics for uh, probably five or six years now. Um, but generally, I work in what I call the theory of normative systems, and uh, the methodology I use there is my PhD is in economics, so I've got formal training in game theory and math, math econ. Um, within economics, I would describe my domain as primarily institutional and organizational economics, so studied a lot early in my career on uh, contracting and complete contracting, bargaining theory, and so on. And then I started thinking about legal systems, which are one of our normative systems from a design point of view. Um, interested in legal theory, that's the other me another methodology I'm using, thinking about the, the theory of what legal systems and now more generally normative systems are designed to do. And um, of late gotten very interested in working uh, with computational methods and multi-agent researchers. So I'll talk a little bit towards the end of this talk about uh, some collaborations I have with a um, uh, multi-agent team at, at DeepMind. Um, okay, so let me, let me start off with some definitions here. Um, and let's see, here we go. Um, 
So what I call normative, by, by norm, the concept of normative infrastructure, um, I mean by that term, the institutions, behaviors, and cognitive architectures that support what I call normative social order. And by normative social order, I mean, this is very much from an economics perspective, an equilibrium supported by third party community punishment of behaviors classified by a community as punishable. So I think of a normative social order as consisting of uh, two elements, a classification um, institution that that classifies all behaviors as this is okay, this is not okay, this is punishable, this is not punishable, this is this is good, this is bad. Um, that there's a classification institution that performs that classification, and you might have overlapping classification institutions in complex societies. But you want to try and think about a simple society here. That there's a classification institution classifies behaviors as okay, not okay and then coordinates and incentivizes third party punishment um, uh, in order to drive behavior towards the, the, the behaviors classified as okay, acceptable, and away from the ones classified as not okay, not acceptable. Um, now, I think one of the things I find, uh, I found in the, the last several years working with people in computer science and from, from technical, uh, backgrounds, uh, and frankly, from a lot of other social sciences as well, a lot of this is quite invisible. Um, and in some ways, I think that's what's so powerful about human normative social orders. It has, it is largely invisible to us. But if you just stop for a moment and think about just where you are in this talk and so on, and the number of behaviors that you could think of that are labeled as okay to do that, not okay to do this, how we're wearing, whether I'm chomping down on a, you know, something to, you know, eat while I'm talking, what I might eat, how you're behaving, putting up hands, wait, letting me talk, not talking over me. I've invited you to, you know, to to interrupt me if if that would be helpful. Um, that you're basically, plus you're living in buildings that were built with lots of <laughs> rules and classification about how they should be built and how the heating should be supplied and and. Um, uh, how the how the materials around us are 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 produced. So you're you're just living in a thick thick soup of classification. And what's interesting theoretically about that is I think you can you can really it really can be helpful and po theoretically powerful to think of that as binary classification. This is okay. This is not okay. I complain about this. I don't complain about that. Uh, I can expect others to complain about this and not about that. There may be disagreement about the classification but we classify in that way as worth a response, not worth a response. Um, so these are a couple of the papers that that uh, put forward this idea of a normative social order, if you wanted to go back and look at the sort of legal theory thinking on this. So the research agenda that I'm very interested in at this point um, is how is it, po is it possible, how would we build AI that can participate in the normative infrastructure of cooperation. And I'm going to say a little bit more um, about cooperation, um, but there's a, I want you to recognize the difference here from uh, the way a lot of talk in, in uh, ethics of AI and so on, or even in alignment and so on, ha has focused on the idea that we'll identify what the values are, we'll identify rules and put those into AI systems. But I think that, that from a social scientist perspective, that's really not not feasible, That's not, and it's not the way humans work. So as part of the, the message here is to say, when I put in this language of participate in the normative infrastructure of, of cooperation, what I want you to see is the complexity of that as a system. And I take as a real um, uh, commitment here, methodologically, and I think you know, in my theory of the world, that cooperative, intel cooperative intelligence is foundational to human life, and it's not something that's added on top. We have a tendency to model things in terms of individual behavior, individual preferences, utility maximization, and so on, and then say, oh, cooperation is the next problem. Once you've got that, it's something else that these individual agents do. Um, and my starting point is you can't understand human behavior and you can't understand complex 
normative orders without understanding that cooperation, cooperative intelligence is foundational. I'm gonna say a bit more about that as we go along. So just to sort of sketch out like that on this, on this research agenda, there's both theoretical work to be done, thinking about the attributes and dynamics of at least initially human cooperation and normative infrastructure. And then there's applied and empirical work, technical work. I mean, the theory can be technical as well, of course. What kinds of AI architectures would support this? What constructed features perhaps in AI environments might be needed like institutions um, uh, with cooperative affordances? Uh, so it's, it's uh, thinking about this both, you know, there's theoretical, as I say, theoretical work to be done. And then, okay, so how would we build once we understand um, but that theory a bit better. And I'm working on both of these dimensions at the same time. But we're gonna start with humans. And this is why I, I know that there's a, I believe there's some social scientists uh, in, in our crowd here. I really think that our theory about humans is not um, yet adequate to help inform what we need to think about with respect to AI. So. Um, I emphasize that even our, our understanding of the theory of why humans are so successful at cooperation and how normativity works is understudied. We have tons of people studying the content of particular normative social orders. So all of our you know, Western philosophy, for example, is about how to understand the relationship between uh, values and ideas in, in a tradition of Western philosophy. Um, we have sociologists who are studying the norms at play in all kinds of different environments. Uh, anthropologists who go, uh, you know, conduct ethnographies and look at detailed analysis of the norms and the normative, you know, the rules, the content, the substance of those rules in lots of settings. And we have economists right doing models that are normative in the sense of we'll define efficiency as a normative goal and now we'll analyze how different policies or market structures would impact efficiency. But the theory of how humans do this at a meta level is deeply understudied. So that's that's also kind of a call to arms for those those of you who are interested in this area. Now I said it's it, it's understudied. There are um, uh, wonderful contributions still to look at here. Um, uh, those of you who might know the cultural evolution literature, there are some in that literature, Boyd and Richardson, Joe Henrich, uh, Sarah Matthew, um, Luther Krishna um, and others who are thinking about the structure of cooperative systems, normative systems and how they evolve and not the specifics of individual ones. Some of you may know Christina Bicchieri's work the theory of studying the theory of social norms. She's thinking very structurally about how normative systems work. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is also where I've been working. And the framing question for this area of work for me is to ask what are the attributes of cognition, behaviors, technologies, and institutions that have evolved among humans to keep groups stable low conflict, productive, and adaptive. And you can see my sort of origins in economic thinking here, saying that stable groups are essential for cumulative culture, which is social learning, for the division of labor, specialization, and technological progress. So when we think about humans as really this, uh, you know, <laughs> very unusual species that have achieved levels of of um, uh, well-being, welfare, um, far beyond any other other species. Sometimes you think, well, that's because of the brain. Well, obviously it's partly because of the brain, but it's fundamentally because we have figured out how to maintain complex groups long enough that they you know, can, uh, in low conflict enough, productive enough, adaptive enough, that they can continue to learn, continue to expand, continue to become increasingly complex. Now, again, we live in environments where we are, we're alert to lots of conflict and failure and ways in which this is not true. Um, but again, it's, 
it's a bit like that, the invisibility of all the structure that's in place that you kind of need to see it. Yeah, we're paying attention to really important conflicts and failures, but it's built on a, a system of enormous cooperative, stable system. And stability is just one of the most important things for a group because you really can't do anything else if your group isn't reasonably uh, stable. Just pausing here in case anybody wants to jump in there. Okay, let me keep going along, but please, uh, please do uh, stop me if you'd like. So this is why I, when I think about cooperation, I say the most fundamental form of cooperation that humans engage in is the cooperation needed to create and maintain the normative infrastructure of cooperative groups. So, and it's the, and cooperative intelligence is the cognitive architecture needed to create and maintain the normative infrastructure of cooperative groups. So part of what I'm calling for in this research agenda is a backing up a level of abstraction to say, when we think about human cooperation, we should analyze how we solve particular cooperative problems, but we should be thinking about how we're solving that fundamental cooperative problem of keeping our groups together and stable so that we have the capacity to solve all kinds of problems. And I also believe this is, when I mention here of cognitive architecture, um, I think this is, you know, one of the most dominant factors in human evolution is the fact that we have developed the cognitive architecture that facilitates our participation in these groups. So, and that's not just learning what the rules are. It's learning that there are things like rules out there. And it's learning how to um, participate in punishing people for violating the rules, like using words in ways that are not like that are dishonest. So Sarah Matthew has a wonderful paper with Rob Boyd, where they argue that third party punishment likely predated the evolution of, of language because language requires confidence that words are being used sincerely, not with lies. And that's a normative, that's a rule. You don't say lion when there's no lion, right? Don't say, you know, oh, sorry, I came back with no berries. You know, the animals got them or I spilled them when you ate them, right? That, that, and those are norms uh, about how you use language norms that it will be enforced by the community. If you come back and say these things and people discover it's not true, that you'll be uh, punished within the group. Maybe just by being, you know, people are less friendly with you and they won't uh, want to spend as much time with you. That may be the punishment. But it's a very interesting idea that 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 the you know the that, that even predates language. So as I, I sort of alluded before, the current or standard approach in economics and what I see in uh, the AI alignment world is to begin with uh, individual optimizing agents and strategic interaction, um, and then to analyze cooperation as some kind of a superstructure built up on top of the individual agent mode. So it's you know it's methodological individualism on steroids. We can we can we can model an individual, and then we can place that in with a utility function and information states and beliefs and so on, and then 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 we can analyze cooperation as an interaction between one or more of uh, two two or more of these uh, individual agents, and there's lots we can do with that. Um, so many of you will recognize sort of the the prisoner's dilemma, and the way we analyze that. In, in economics and in game theory. And this is uh, obviously something that a lot of people in AI and AI alignment and in cooperative AI are thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we solve the prisoner's dilemma um, when A and B are engaged in this kind of a strategic um, relationship? And the solution sets we think about are primarily ones that involve second the second party enforcement or retaliation. So tit for tat or self-enforcing agreements, uh, looking for subgame perfect Nash equilibria, grim trigger strategies, right? We we look, we basically solve 
this problem inside the box. We say this is a complete description of the strategic situation, and we look for solutions within this box. And uh, I think one of the motivations for me of doing this work is I don't think we can solve this problem inside the box. And uh, it's, got, it's highly restrictive, it's got a very small solution space. It's one of the things you'll take away if you go and study what's, what's feasible. If you're thinking about what's stable, equilibrium, uh, there's a limited set of things that, there's a limited set of agreements you can, that can be self-enforcing, right? There's a limited set of, of uh, strategy pairs that can be in that game, a sub-game perfect Nash equilibrium. And it leaves unexplained what kind of cognitive architecture or social structure came in to play, to, to structure this game in the first place. So a colleague of mine, uh, Bob McGibbons at MIT, uh, has done, who works in incomplete contracting theory in particular, um, he and Rebecca Henderson have, have talked a lot about in the incomplete contracting setting, or the fact that in a lot of these contexts, we, um, we've assumed that the hard part of solving these kinds of strategic interactions is the, the commitment or credibility problem. If I announce I'm gonna play cooperate, what's the basis for that being a credible commitment? Um, and very little uh, energy and time spent on the what they call the clarity problem. How do we even write down the, these payoffs? How do we how do we define who the unit, the individual is? How do we know what it is? How do we label something, cooperate or defect? And the thing that I really want to emphasize is this is not actually how humans work. Now I'm an economist. I'm happy to use modeling techniques that are not intended to be representations of everything humans are or do because they provide insight into human behavior. But here I think we're missing something very, very important. And that is that we have been so successful and really emphasize phenomenally successful at cooperation uh, through recruiting third party enforcement. And we are the only species that significantly recruits third party enforcement. This means that somebody who's not engaged in this, in the interaction, not A or B, is involved in participating in enforcing the rules about how an A, a and B play this game, and you just don't see that in other uh, in other species. Now, when I say third party enforcement, most people think of something like this. This is an important form of uh, third party enforcement in our modern societies. It's centralized. It's formal, um, but it's a tiny fraction. Uh, it, it's a pretty small fraction, even in our modern societies, of enforcement schemes. Um, but it's definitely small if you look at it across human history. Uh, most third-party enforcement is uh, decentralized and informal. Um, and it escalates all the way from things like uh, making fun of someone, um, about how they how they speak, how they dress, how they eat, what activities they do. Uh, think about the ways in which even in your own brain, that sort of as you play through, oh, what would happen if I walked into the room and said this? Or if I think about this with mask wearing during the pandemic, I think a lot of us are going back and forth. What will people think if I walk in the room wearing a mask, not wearing a mask today, right? And that's going back and forth. And a lot of it is about anticipating and feeling uncomfortable because our brains have adapted in this way. Oh, you know, if, if, if I thought they were gonna go to each other, hey, look at that, right? Look over there, look what he, she, they are doing. Um, but that's a form of enforcement. Um, and this, this uh, list here actually uh, comes from a wonderful paper I highly recommend everybody. Uh, Polly Wiesner's Norm Enforcement Among the Johansi Bushmen, um, in which she, you know, she, her ethnography was to pay attention to the enforcement mechanisms the, and, and this, the, the multi-person, three, three or more person conversations about norm violations. And what she saw was that there was this escalation from, you know, initial trans, transgressions might be subject to mockery. Uh, that might escalate if there was no response to some mild criticism, harsher criticism, ultimately to exclusion. And exclusion, being kicked out of the group is the most is the dominant method human that, you know, the, the, the big hammer that humans have used 
throughout history is uh, is exclusion, being outlawed, thrown out of the group, thrown out of the family, um, and and cut off from the benefits of cooperation. Um, and very rarely, she said, only two percent of cases she saw uh, is there physical violence. And she is Simone de Johansi, uh, and that can vary across societies, but. Again, just sort of say when we when I use the language of collective punishment or enforcement, people go think of mob violence, and that is there on the on the on the fringes for sure. But there's a ton of enforcement mechanisms there as well. So I think this is the basis I've said for our evolutionary advantage as humans and the cognitive architecture of cooperative uh, intelligence. That third party enforcement vastly expands the set of possible. Um, solutions because almost any equilibrium can be achieved and almost any rule can be enforced if the group is coordinated to say we will all jump up and down five times and sing happy birthday before we sit down to eat and they have coordinated enforcement around that that's what will occur in that community um, and there's again some wonderful papers from boyd and richardson boyd gintis and bowles uh, looking at this in uh, with evolutionary game theory um, and my favorite there the title punishment allows the evolution of cooperation or anything else in sizable groups um, so that's um, so yeah our cooperation norm we can with a cooperation norm we can get cooperative behavior in the um, prisoner's dilemma by the fact that we exclude the, the person who does not cooperate right we establish what it means to cooperate in a given setting, that's common knowledge and we're coordinated to exclude someone, punish them in some way uh, for not, but it also means we can get cooperation no matter what the other payoffs are. So we're no longer restricted uh, in these ways. Now, maybe not whatever they are because it depends on what the cost is of being excluded and the cost of excluding. So that's part of the analysis here too. One of the things I think that helps us with is uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's a bit of a bonus that it significantly reduces the dimensionality of what we're trying to solve for, because we're not trying to solve each and every, not trying to characterize and solve, stout, you know, identify the payoffs, understand who the players are, characterize the beliefs, for every single cooperative interaction that we're trying to build. It's saying, you know, you basically you build this system that can take almost any value uh, in the relevant variables and focus on that, right? It's very different to say, how will we establish a system of rules? Then how would we establish all of these rules? Hammurabi's code is one of my great favorite examples, right? 237 or 87 rules carved into a big, tall, black piece of stone. The, 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 the organization of that enforcement system is around how do we enforce Hammurabi's code? Is Hammurabi's code being enforced? Not keeping track of all the individual rules. I think this uh, gives rise to the potential for also for a meaningful transfer learning. Again, if we're thinking about training our artificial agents, if they become competent at understanding, okay, how do I go into this environment and read what the structure is? And then if they go to a different environment, if the rules change, um, how do they uh, learn those learn those uh, new rules? If this is adapt, this is adaptable, um, transferable learning. Uh, so there's my point that the enforcement game is the most important form of cooperation. Um, now I'm going to say I was I was at this point I was going to say a little bit more in detail about some of the theoretical work here. But uh, Cara, do you uh, think we should pause for some questions? Looks like somebody's got some. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, if I can, can I have a question, can you go one slide back? Uh, one uh, more? This one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious. So I, I really like the point about uh, reducing dimensionality where uh, where each agent is only trying to solve sort of local, uh, I want to adhere to the norms while also achieving some like uh, selfish goal, goals of mine. Uh, but I don't, I don't see how... Uh, Sort of evolution of the whole system uh, works out, or something like uh, adapting to the system to the to the actual goals of the group. Um, something like uh, if you if you if you if, if the norms or or sorry or a different question would be how do the norms actually emerge? 
because it seems yes. like uh, if you if you re reduce uh, uh, the complexity where every agent is only optimizing for, for themselves, how do they make sure that they uh, that the actual view they end up in is actually uh, somewhat adequate? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's great. Um, and actually, that that's uh, sorry. Your name is just uh, Tomas. Tomas. Hi. Thanks. Um, all right, so uh, actually that, that, that's a really great question for me to go to this slide here. Um, and then to go back to, uh, because this is what we were, um, uh, my, my co-author Barry Weingast, he's a political scientist at, at uh, uh, Stanford. This is what we were thinking about, this is 10 years ago. This is thinking about how could we model legal systems? And as I mentioned earlier, we said, okay, if we want to have a reduced, we, 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 we're, uh, we're going to have a, a, a minimalist, we want, we want to put as little into the assumptions of this model as possible. So we said, it, it, they're all individual maximizing agents. So I'm using that methodological individualism. And we have two things, we have a classification institution and an enforcement mechanism. And the fundamental question we asked in this paper is what do the in the characteristics of the classification institution have to be in order to induce we have a very very simple little model it's just we have it in buyer seller context there's there's a seller out there who's cheating both two buyers how do they coordinate third party enforcement so you and me Tomash, and you know we're we'll, we're both agreed to, to punish the seller for violating the contract with each of us so i i come to your aid when you've been the victim of, of a breach and you come to my aid when I've been the victim. And so that's the, the theoretical problem we were solving for. And we ended up in a theory here that said, fundamentally what defines a legal order is that it has uh, generated a, it, it, that is based on, they, somehow this group has, managed to establish a classification institution that is unique, that is stable, that has these characteristics we call legal attributes of generality and prospectivity. Um, it is the authoritative steward of the classifications. Now, the, the point there is, so your question was about where do the norms come from? So we started off at the at the end of legal theory with legal theory, right? So which which is our we we live in legal orders. Most of us around the world live in legal legal orders, uh, and we were saying and precisely what defines a legal order is it has an authoritative, unique classification institution that announces what the rules are and resolves ambiguity in the rules. So we hadn't actually thought about cultural and alternative theories prior to that. But I would say prior to that, we have classification institutions that are discursive and emergent. So if you think about Pauli Wiesner and the, the Johann Z living in bands of say 25 or 30 people and having conversations daily about behavior. And they and, and basically you get into a two or three, four person group and you talk about the behavior of others and you settle on was that okay or not okay. And that's an emergent method for uh, settling on the um, the norms. But it's precisely going to your question about how do you adapt the content of those norms because that's what we need to do. Environments change, populations change, causal understanding changes. And this is why I say there's evolutionary pressure to come up with other methods in order to be able to adapt those rules more quickly. So we ended up with a definition that said a legal order is one that can change the rules without disrupting equilibrium. Last, two, last year, we said you don't have to wear a bicycle. No, nobody cared if you wore a bicycle helmet while, while bicycling. Or maybe some people thought you were silly and other. But then we had an announcement that there was a rule that you wear a bicycle, the helmet while bicycling. And if we, we've managed to recruit the enforcement around that, particularly the social enforcement around that, that would be uh, a legal order. So just to, I've, I've said a lot because there was a lot I wanted to say about this, these concepts here, but your question, where do the norms come from? 
is a fundamental challenge for the uh, uh, normative infrastructure to solve for. And if you sort of now, if you step back and say, that's actually, so now you wanna say, look at a particular community and say, okay, how does that community establish what the rules are? And what mechanism do they have, if any, for adapting the rules? So again, I see sort of legal order as emerging in response to the demand for the resolution of ambiguity and the adaptability of the content of norms in ways that allow without disrupting equilibrium. You don't have to say, I'm leaving this group and setting up my own group to create new rules. Does that make sense? Is that? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I was basically curious about uh, when, when you are modeling those, uh, uh, those, those systems or looking at the systems in, in reality. I mean, I can imagine uh, that some groups or some cultures would have, uh, would have sort of top-down systems. So they would establish something like a government that would uh, that would uh, somehow indirectly like that's one social technology for for actually creating those norms. Uh, I was more curious. Uh, I mean, I, I can see that. I'm not sure how I, how, I, how I would model it. So I was more curious about the sort of like if I imagine a, a tribal group, uh, which probably doesn't have that. Maybe maybe they somehow implicitly have that because there is probably something like the uh, group of elders or something like that who might have much more influence on on changing the norms. Uh, but still, that feels more like it's working within the system, that it's more like those three people have a discussion about, about the norm, and then they, those five people have a discussion, and it sort of some, somehow feels like something which feels like it could be more modeled inside of the system, and I'm sort of like just curious in this direction. Also, I don't, don't want to like derail, derail your, your talk, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm most interested whether there are some, some thoughts in this direction or uh, maybe if it appears long later in the talk or what do you think? Yeah, so, so let's, let, um, let, let's just note that this is a fundamental research question. What are the techniques that, that humans can, and now, and then and now thinking about artificial agents, what, what alternative, I'll call them institutions, and I mean by institution, not a blocky looking building, but you know, an emergent, emergent classification is an institution. Right, conversations under the tree among people of three and saw five and so on is an institution, a council of elders, a shaman, a chief, a democratic council. Um, you know, all of these are institutions. And if you look at human history and you read your read your stories now through that lens and say, what was the classification institution and how well did it work and what are the alternatives? And the point of this paper was to say the theory here was to say we can say something theoretical about what the attributes of that is, uh, institution need to be in order to maintain the stability of that group and to incentivize and coordinate actors around that classification institution. And I think that's a set of constraints and gives you some idea about how to think about how you'd answer your question of how would you build something different, right? And how would you... You said top down. I mean, I think we're in a moment in history, right? We're really, really facing the need to rethink how we do democracy. So it's okay. How how does that how? Um, and I, I, this is giving you some theoretical tools for thinking about, from a positive predictive point of view, what are the characteristics maybe need to be. So oh, obviously we have. Okay, great. How, how do we build artificial agents with cooperative intelligence? So what, is I, what do I mean by that? Because um, I've been talking about humans. So I think this means we need to think about building agents that ha um, have, can pay attention to, perceive, be responsive to the content and stability of normative equilibria, normative behavior, and normative um, institutions. Now, I wanted to point out that this, uh, I love a lot of the work in cultural evolution, but um, I'm, you know, we're starting to see some of this emerge and I'm involved in some of these efforts in collaboration with cultural evolution theorists. Um, but in a lot of the cultural evolution uh, research, maybe some of you know, so for example, the work that DeepMind is doing, again, which I, I like a lot of, uh, there's still this idea of thinking about social learning as imitative. And I think it, we need to think about it as fundamentally normative. It's not just that we copy because we think that we will get the highest payoff if we copy. It's that we copy what somebody's doing because we take that as a signal that not doing that is something that would be, you know, critiqued by our community. 
And then that the level of group selection, if there's group selection, the level of selection is at the level of the infrastructure, not of the norm. So it, it's sort of implicit in a lot of, and it's understood as a weakness in current cultural evolution theory that there's group selection that leads to the persistence of particular norms that you know, groups that have better norms uh, are more stable, they grow better. And that's actually not a very good and plausible story about cultural evolution because there's too many norms. There's just way too many. There's norms about everything. Um, so uh, I'm starting to explore with, with, with researchers the idea of selection being at the level of the infrastructure, what allows the group to maintain stability, to grow, to persist, to find better solutions because it persists is, uh, uh, is happening at the level of do they have a stable architecture for cooperation enforcement, classification and enforcement. Um, so what does this mean for AI? I think it means to think about what does it mean for AI and humans to be in a group because that's the fundamental challenge here. How do you maintain the stability and productivity of groups? Um, and then can we build AIs that like humans recognize the value uh, and work to maintain, the value of and work to maintain group stability? Um, so uh, I was gonna go through some examples. This, is, this includes some research projects that I'm involved in that I know about or people have been thinking about. Um, and I could, um, Car, I could at this point start talking a little bit about um, some, some work I've done on, on silly rules um, and or talk about other things, or we could also open it up at this point. What do you think? Um, I'm happy to take a moment for questions, but I also want to check um, how much time do you have? Yep. Oh, how much time do I have? Yeah, so I, I, I think if, if we wanted to go as long as two hours, I can do that. Right. Oh, yeah, in that case, um, I think maybe taking a few minutes of questions, if anyone has any, and then we can carry on with, uh, with the, the next bit of what you sure. tell us. Uh, I could also are you clapping or are you raising your hand? Yeah, the usual confusion. I'm actually doing both this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I loved your talk, Jillian. Probably like a lot of people have been discovering like a similar thesis on my own. And I loved the clarity you brought to my emerging intuitions. So one thing that uh, you mentioned group selection uh, and before you were also talking about evolutionary pressure. And one of the reasons that uh, cooperation seems to be a superstructure is some kind of selfish gene-like intuitions. That's probably why I lean towards methodological individualism at all, was because group selection seemed to be a myth. Now, I don't know a lot about evolutionary theory generally, but I'm wondering if this is in conflict with that perspective, with the selfish gene perspective, or the intuitions not even apply. If you have something to say here. Oh, it, this is great. Thank, thanks for asking that, Sahil, because it, it gives me a chance to, um, I'm very excited about this direction for cultural evolution. Um, and uh, I've actually, I've got a postdoc joining me who has just finished a PhD with Joe Henrich, um, uh, whose who's, uh, name is Graham Noblet. Um, he's, he's joining me. Um, uh, from the background of cultural evolution, right in the heart of it, um, but he's very interested in these questions of, of artificial agents, as well as the role of institutions in cultural evolution. So um, I'll have, uh, to, I'm, I'm mentioning that to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull together a community of people to start working on this. And so I'll uh, mention that there's somebody who's at a similar stage uh, for many of you, um, that would be a great connection to make. So, um, the so actually the, the the relationship between these ideas and like concepts of the selfish gene and the idea of you know human humans evolved from that kind of genetic competition that it was you know genetic selection and the idea of sociobiology which was um, you know very hot when I was when I was at your stage I actually just just finished my my PhD, um, and uh, I've read an 
uh, book, uh, Boyd and Richardson, uh, The Evolution of, I think it's called The Evolution of Culture. Um, and just a, a stunning point to be made at this point, uh, at, at the time of sort of sociobiology was to say, look, it wouldn't make evolutionary theory to put all of these behaviors into genetic material. That's like hardwiring all of your choices. You're better as a, as a species to put it into the software, which they called culture, behavior. And they introduced the idea that there was something like uh, biological evolution, genetic evolution happening with cultural um, uh, behaviors and norms. So they started using the same kinds of modeling techniques to think about the way cultural traits, behavioral traits could be passed on and replicated in groups. Now that that line of thinking has has uh, evolved, but I think it's, it starts with a really key insight going to your question, Sahil, which is, um, uh, the, the behaviors that we're talking about here that really, that say these cooperative behaviors are rooted in the evolution of something that is built on top of, is not reduced to genetic evolution. And so if you meant selfish gene in the sense of actually the gene, right? Evolution, genetic evolution, extremely good basis for saying, no, this, you, can't, you can't get this through genetic evolution. You know what? And this kind of goes to Tomasha's question. That's really, really slow, right? Just, just how, how on earth would we handle pandemics where we have to fundamentally change a whole bunch of behavior if we were, you know, you had to wait for genes to evolve, to mutate and evolve in the right way. It's undirected. So I think of even culture as coming on as a much better adaptive mechanism Right, so the idea that the group can have norms and that those are flexible and it's the plasticity of norms that makes them such an incredible source of adaptation. And what we're adding to that is the idea that then we can get infrastructure, the goal of which, again, going back to my exchange with Tamash, is, is the goal of that is to, how, how can we get that adaptive mechanism to perform even better? So, there are still, as, as I pointed out, just very quickly going over that, that initial paper, um, you know, you can build with the idea that we have individual maximizing agents. And I think that's really quite important, again, for a methodological reason, because I don't think you can make predictions about behaviors that will emerge and be stable over long periods of time for humans or institutions without having it grounded at some level in, yep, this works for each of the individuals each of the individuals having to make their own judgment um, of, is this good for me or bad for me? Um, but the question that the, these individual maximizing agents are making with, in this perspective is frequently the one of, should I stay or should I go? Is this group okay for me? Because if it is, the only way I survive in this group is to play by the rules of the group. Right, to be critical of what this group is critical of, to avoid the behaviors that this group is critical of. And I remember I said that like one of the most important methods that humans have used for, um, you know, the, I said the big hammer of failing to play by the rules of the group is throwing people out of the group. So you, so, so you can have your individual maximizing agent, but what they're evaluating is not, do I wanna play this strategy or that strategy in this particular game? It's at that meta level of, Oh boy, if I don't play by the rules of the game here, if I don't play the cooperative strategy here, or I don't go along with this behavior that seems pointless to me, and much of it is pointless, I can get to the silly rules stuff, um, I may get kicked out of the group. And then my, so that my choice is not, you know, the, 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 the way we model this now, and even maybe in the selfish gene approach is, is as if you just take for granted the stability of everything around you oh, I could choose this or that and still continue in this particular game. So the choice, so it's still, um, so the, yeah, so that's, that's getting to the point of, it, you couldn't really have selection at the level of the individual. There's, there's no such thing as the human individual actually surviving. 
every and all humans need other humans around and therefore the fundamental problem is how do you keep that group together is that addressing your question still or helping anymore yeah, yeah yeah i think so and i think i'm also a little confused so let me just try to quickly like refine the analogy so i think uh so the selfish gene perspective is like evolutionary pressure grounds out in a gene like the individual is actually a more fragile boundary and so the analogy would be something like group identity is pretty fragile. And so if you apply optimization pressure, it'll actually ground out in individual strategy changes. And so what I understood you to be saying was something like uh, the reason it is possible when you talked about cultural evolution and we talked about hardwiring is that this is about a difference in time scale, like at the level of what's happening within centuries, you do have somewhat stable groups. But then you did bring up the question of you did point out that actually people are constantly thinking about uh you know exiting and entering groups and then that that seems to say again that actually group identities are fragile so that would actually undermine group selectionism from my perspective so i'm, I'm a little confused about that okay yeah um so, so i i want so i want to say pick up in there the idea that thinking about the group is fundamental that's the first order like so that that for an individual to say uh in any choice i'm making what's the impact on my connection to this group right so that so i think that that i agree with now i didn't intend i said i didn't intend to say people are constantly thinking should i stay or should i go from this group i said i did say that i did say that they're thinking about that all the time but the answer usually is, oh my gosh, I need to stay. I need to not get kicked out. Right. Right. right? That's that's actually that that it's it, it it because the so so think of think of think about the the evolutionary context in which humans uh, emerge, right? And the the way in which a lot you know for millennia, right? The way in which um, a lot of our uh, institutional precursors and probably our cognitive architecture as well as getting is getting laid down uh, those are settings in which um, leaving a group is a very very high consequence decision or outcome so either deciding to leave um, or being kicked out um, and people do get kicked out they get they get they get banished or and maybe for a period of time maybe not permanently um, and people do leave uh, but they don't leave they try not to leave on their own they try to leave with others and so I think about the coordination of that um, and the consequences are quite the consequences are quite great um, because you you abandon all those benefits of uh, that make a group such a value you know all those benefits that a group can generate specialization shared protection insurance uh, risk sharing um all of those benefits of the group so so i think probably uh, my language of it's that constant should i stay or should i go is what was confusing to you and it was probably not a good way of putting it um uh it's really um we do think about that but in the vast majority of cases it has to get quite bad before we say i'm going to go right. and even then i can't go on my own yeah that, I mean, that clears up completely yeah thank you Tina. Okay, great. Anybody else want to jump in here? Well, let me, um, Cara, unless you're seeing something. I am not. I don't see any okay. answer right now. Okay, so let me, uh, let me push on and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of, of uh, the work I've been doing. Um, and that'll also give some more perspective on what we mean here. So um, I have a couple of papers uh, with um, Dylan hadfield Manel, who is indeed related to me, he's my son. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, eventually I'll get to the one with the uh, group at, at DeepMind. So in thinking about um, how we would analyze rural infrastructure or normative infrastructure instead of individual norms. So most of our analysis of norms, say economic analysis of norms, happens at the level of the norm. So, you know, you have, um, uh, you have, think, like, you know, 
Robert Sugden, for example, analyzing um, hawk dove games and you know, artic you know, arguing from games like that why we would expect to see the emergence of uh, property rules. Um, so the or, or or we have behavioral economics that is studying so the emergence of norms of fairness. And um, when you start thinking about normative infrastructure and say, actually, you don't, the, the thing that makes it so valuable is fundamentally its plasticity, its capacity for taking different values, depending on the environment and our understanding of it. Then what you wanna do is analyze that at the level of the normative infrastructure. And one of the things that gets you doing is say, okay, don't think about the individual rules and the payoffs associated with individual rules, but think about the payoffs associated with a set of rules. And this is actually one of the things I think was, was one of the, um, as I was first starting to think about this stuff, and I mentioned already Hammurabi's code, the, the reduction of dimensionality. The idea that it's the attributes of a set of rules that matters and not just the individual rules. Obviously the attributes of the set, the payoff of the set is a function at some level of the payoffs of the individual rules in the set. Um, but what we're looking to do is stabilize that set of rules and what this led was to thinking about what about rule what about rules that don't have any positive welfare impact in the set and we're going to call these silly rules silly rules we define in this work as rules that had no direct impact on welfare and you are living in a soup of silly rules like the color clothing that you wear um, you know, like to some extent, what foods you eat or don't eat, the words you use and don't use. Um, there's, if, if you look around, again, if you look around at just how we interact, there's a lot of rules that it really wouldn't matter if we did it this way or that way as a group. So there's no, so we define a silly rule as there's no direct impact on welfare. And then we define an important rule as one that does have a direct impact on welfare. Um, so I, I like to give the example of mask wearing again, to say before the pandemic, uh, before pandemics, before uh, in the absence of pandemics, not wearing a mask, a medical mask in public is a silly rule. It really doesn't matter if you do or not, it doesn't have any impact on anything. But most of us did not wear masks in public um, because there was just a silly rule that said you shouldn't wear masks in public, even if for some reason you wanted to wear a medical mask in public. Um, obviously, that becomes an important rule during the, during pandemics um, or heightened attention to to uh, airborne illnesses. And then we get a change in the rule, and it's no longer a silly rule. But I want I want you to first sort of <laughs> look around and think about the silly rules in your that you're you're following right now. Um, so we had these hypotheses that groups that had more sufficiently low cost silly rules would be more likely to survive shocks to beliefs or uncertainty about the enforcement of the rule their rule set so that, that there would there that this would lead to a prediction that groups with more silly rules would be more stable and persistent in size and given the sort of the evolutionary story we've got sort of built in the background here, therefore we would expect to see the persistence of silly rules um, in rule sets. Even though many of us would go around and say, we really should just get rid of these sets of rules. Or if I asked you, would you rather live in a rule in a world with just important rules? Or would you like to live in a world with those important rules, but a bunch of stupid stuff thrown in as well? I think most initially would say, I'd rather live in the world where I just have to worry about the important rule. I don't want to have to, it's stupid. It's stupid to have silly rules. Um, but we had these hypotheses that silly rules would um, uh, make uh, groups more robust to uncertainty and shocks, and that it would make them more adaptable. They would collapse faster in response to shock to the truth about the stability. Like if their group no longer was holding together, if you're a member of a 
small religious minority, for example, in a larger society, you kind of want to know, you know, is there enough of us still going to be around in five years that if I choose not to marry outside of the group, I will be able to find a partner, etc. So these were our hypotheses, and we confirmed both of these hypotheses. We ran computational experiments. They were um, palm DPs solving for it's a, uh, populations of, I think, a thousand in each population, um, uh, populations of agents, but just very, very simple agents solving palm DPs where they were in repeated interaction, three party interaction. Um, there, uh, every interaction, there would be a draw from the rule set of a rule that was governing the interaction, very, very reduced form. Um, uh, there was uh, one of the three agents would be the perpetrator of that violation, one would be the victim of the violation, and the third party would be a third party. No direct impact, um, and just a third party, uh, uh, third party agent. And each of our agents uh, was either a member, either had the, was either a punishing agent or a non-punishing agent. And again, I don't really like assuming things like there's a punishing type and a non-punishing type uh, because punishment is a behavior. So I want to go down to the foundations of that, micro foundations, and say it's a it's a choice. I want to model that. But this particular first paper, we we just took it as a, which is the way the cultural evolution literature, for example, does as a type. And uh, what we were looking at was the size of these groups because. After each interaction, agents had the option to decide to either continue with the group, go on to the next interaction, or to leave the group and take their individualized risk-free payoff. And what we did was initialize, you sort of assume, assume that all that this has been running long enough that everybody understands how it works. So we weren't training these agents in any sense. Um, and then imagine there's a shock to the community. So it's, it's originally in equilibrium. There are enough punishers in the group that there's a high enough probability that in a random three-party interaction, that third party is a punisher who will help deter. And then we, we gave our agents the opportunity to signal that they were punishers uh, before the violation occurred. So having a punisher in the group would deter the violation, although that ends up being not terribly important to the results. Um, and so what can happen in this setting is, so, so if, if we're in a stable equilibrium with enough uh, punishing agents, individuals will say, oh, unexpected value staying in this group is worth it because at some point I'm gonna be in an in important interaction, it'll be an important rule, and the likelihood is high enough there'll be a third party who punishes in the group and so I'll be protected against the violation of that important rule like theft of property or breach of contract, something like that. But if that probability, that belief drops far enough, the agent would say it's no longer worth staying in this group because the benefit of being in the group is the enforcement of these rules. And if I don't think there's enough punishers around, no point being in the group, I might as well go take my safe payoff. Um, and then we effectively, you know, you can interpret it as a shock to the system said, okay, now suppose everybody's beliefs about the proportion of punishers is uh, is shocked so that there's uh, substantial uncertainty about the likelihood of, of punishers. And the only way of learning how many punishers are around is to engage in interactions in the community because the only way you get observations on the presence of punishers, the frequency of punishers is through collecting information by interacting in the community, which is a fairly realistic um, story to tell here. And then we varied across uh, communities, the proportion of silly rules in the rule set. So all these communities had the same, all these groups had the same important rules. We just varied the basic, and they came along at the same rate. And we just basically varied the number of silly rule interactions that might get jammed into the time before, you know, the, before the expected time of the next important interaction. So it's a little bit, I'm gonna get up in the morning and you know, go to uh, my workplace and I have a risk that somebody's gonna steal my wallet at my workplace. Um, on the way to the workplace, 
do I, you know, have people that I should, you know, tip my hat at, you know, uh, coffees I should drink or dogs I should not kick or clothing that I don't, I could wear anything. It's like, how many rules are there on the way to the office and that interaction? And what we were able to show is that the groups that had more silly rules, so this density here is the density of silly rules. Those are the blue uh, groups and the size of the uh, circle is showing the number of members of the group that are there after along the x-axis, the number of important community interactions, because again, those are coming along at the same rate in all these societies. Um, the the blue societies there you can see this on the vertical axis is the proportion of communities that are active which is to say that they still got enough group members that they're continuing uh, they haven't collapsed um, uh, we can see that the blue communities which have a higher proportion of silly rules um, they maintain population better and they maintain the, maintain the size of the population better and they avoid collapse better. So after, you know, we go out to 250 important interactions, we've got 75% of our high, den, high lots of silly rules communities uh, um, uh, continue to exist. Um, and it's about 65% of our groups that have just those important rules. The way you sort of think you'd start out by saying, please just give me important rules. Don't tell me I have to follow a bunch of silly rules. and that so that was a that's a shock to beliefs. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Or this was a shock to beliefs about the proportion of punishers. Um, but there's actually been no underlining change in the ground truth of the proportion of punishers. Um, so this is like there's a group of you know, new immigrants to our group, and when they arrive, we don't know do they do they follow our rules? Do they help enforce our rules? Will they punish violations of our rules? Will they think it's a, a bad thing when somebody steals my wallet at the office? Will they think it's a bad thing if somebody wears um, the wrong kind of shirt or skirt uh, uh, into the street? Um, and so the blue communities, basically, they are more likely to figure out, oh, yeah, these folks are just like us, because it turns out they are, um, and maintain stability in the face of that shock. We also looked at what we call the population shock. Um, which was where that group of new immigrants for if you just as an interpretation um, actually do have a different set of rules and they don't punish the same things. And there are fewer punishers of the set of rules uh, actually there. Um, they um, uh, and, and what you see here is that the optimal thing for that group to do is to collapse because they no longer have adequate punishment capacity for their set of rules. So they shouldn't waste the energy and effort Right, you don't want to stay in a group that's not enforcing its its uh, important rules because you're putting yourself at risk. Right, you're engaging in interaction that's not being uh, deterred. Uh, that you're engaging in interactions that put you at risk of being the victim of some kind of loss. And our uh, uh, silly rule communities figure that out very quickly. Um, the the communities with um, without silly rules. It takes them much longer, and some of them never do figure out they should have collapsed. So the insights from this is that that normative infrastructure uh, with a lot of low cost silly rules is providing more information about how effectively the group is enforcing its set of rules. So that is critical information for the decision making of each of those individual agents. And so you want to think of that as an information problem, that if you weren't thinking about how do we maintain normative infrastructure, you wouldn't be thinking, how does somebody know that they're in a stable group that enforces the rules? And this is actually um, uh, something that I think is really important for this idea of thinking about the cognitive architecture of the maintenance of uh, normative infrastructure um, is you know, our attentiveness to enforcement behavior. Um, and, and our attentiveness to um, the, the likelihood that our group is still in a stable uh, equilibrium. And in this sense, silly rules are promoting group robustness and uh, adaptability. Does anybody want to ask any like questions question. about this paper? Yeah. Uh, Tomasz? Yeah. Uh, thanks. So I understand this is this is meant mostly as a as a simple model, but uh, an objection that comes to mind is uh, along the lines of 
some of the important norms that are actually costly to maintain uh, are probably maintained differently than, than the low effort norms of sort of, uh, I don't know, you know, pretending outrage at someone violating and like a non-costly signaling rule. Uh, I'm, I'm not asking for a more complex model. I'm just asking how much do you think this is a concern in, in real societies that, that actually like, in some sense, I can imagine that people sort of like, either are enforcing the rules in, the rules in general with some, uh, with some variance or not. Or, or on the other hand, it seems like there are classes of rules which are mostly uh, sort of in, in for, uh, enforced uh, as a uh, as a form of pretense or signaling by by people who act, uh, ignore some other rules. Like, uh, yeah, I, I don't have good examples, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious. What do you, what do you think, or if there, yeah. if there is some evidence? Yeah, yeah no, it's a, it's it's a critical it's a critical question because the the fundamental mechanism that's at work here is the idea that a that observing behavior about the enforcement of silly rules is informative about enforcement of important rules so it, it we we could accommodate in this model um you know that may, we could accommodate a lower likelihood right we could accommodate that a silly rule has a lower likelihood of punishment than a um violation of an important rule um uh we just need some correlation to get predictive power so that it the because you think about that palm dp structure right the the reason to stay in the group is to collect information and you collect information by interacting um, and that's only valuable the, the facility rule interactions are only valuable if they're going to help you predict how uh, violations of important rules will be treated, well, but whether they'll be punished. So we could vary, we could, we could make this a little bit more complex with differentiation and probability of enforcement and even size of enforcement, the cost of enforcement. Um, and I think we'd get the same, we'd get the same result. But I also wanna emphasize that one of the things that I think if you look around the way human societies, and it's, it's really important to try not to think of um, our the societies we live in right now, highly complex, lots of centralized enforcement. We've actually evolved to, to maintain this equilibrium with tons of variability and tolerance. So I, I actually, I would make a prediction that we have fewer, we have still have lots of silly rules, but I think we have fewer silly rules in advanced uh, legal orders than in um, uh, uh, earlier non-legal or earlier legal legal orders. Um, but the groups actually, precisely because if you looked around and said, that's a silly rule, but like, why should I care about what color shirt somebody wears to a funeral? Right? Why should I care? It's a silly rule. But in fact, can, if if we did that, if we remember, think about we're uh, we, we're just I've just shown you uh, some evidence for the claim that silly rules promote group robustness and adaptability, and that therefore they are good for society. So we might suppose that groups that, that groups have developed systems to protect the presence of silly rules, and protect them against things like, hey, that's a silly rule. Let's get rid of that one. And what we see if we look at sets of rules across human societies is we do tend to treat them as groups of rules. So um, the, you know, a lot of our silly rules are actually violation of our silly rules. It's actually treated as significant violation. And there can be a lot of meaning poured into those silly rules. So think about religious groups or religious beliefs. Religious groups are often defined by a lot of silly rules. Words that you say, clothing that you wear, head coverings that you wear. Like these are silly in the sense, not of they're stupid or meaningless, but silly in the sense that they don't have a direct impact on welfare, right? But they are ways in which that group is able to constantly monitor the stability and enforcement of the set of rules. And that's important. And so in fact, what we see is we don't see this, you know, I think kind of Tomasz sort of in your question, the idea that our silly rules will be forgiven easily. Some might be 
but the important rules will be seriously enforced. We, you know, we see people um, burned at the stake for violating silly rules in human societies, uh, kicked out, banished from cult, polite culture for saying the wrong words. Um, we, we certainly see that. And there's actually a reason to think that that's the case that we, that as a group, again, if the silly rules are promoting robustness and adaptability, then in developing systems of meaning that invest rules, uh, even the silly rules will meaning will promote that as well. Obviously there's a downside to that, right? They are, they are costly. So there's some balance in this story here, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, thanks. it'd be a great uh, thing to explore. It would be it would be a great thing to explore, but I've got I've got stories about it. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that. Like one one paraphrase uh, would be that uh, the silly rules, or like the adherence to silly, silly rules, is is a signal of uh, of a willingness to adhere to, adhere to the rules in general or to the group or. Uh, and also, uh, like the, the rules that you mentioned, like even just varying different types of clothes can be costly. Uh, like the, the cost is not high, but then by them being somewhat costly, uh, it is actually like a more uh, more uh, robust signaling. Uh, I, uh, I, I just I just one one remark. I was actually worried about like the cases of if I imagine something like uh, mafia societies where uh, you have a lot of a lot of uh, silly rules like different politeness rules and uh, uh, a lot of lot of decorum and uh, but on the other hand you can have uh, violations on like basic contracts and stuff like that uh, but yeah. so that's uh, I, I see I see that this is like much more complex than than the example uh, that we have shown and, and you're right that like I, I would totally agree that there was there is definitely a correlation between like adherence to uh, to silly rules and to and to serious rules uh, yeah. even in society disconnected partially Right, right, and and the you know the the example I, I generally give when I present this paper is from a study, uh, and I do this because I want something so outside of our experience. We don't, you know, that uh, so so it's a study of arrow making among the Awa Indians of Brazil, um, and there's a lot of rules about how you make uh, arrows. Only men make arrows. They have to be a particular length. You must use this kind of wood, not that kind of wood for the shaft, a different kind of wood for the tip. Uh, feathers on the feathers on the back, but only um, it's either dark colored or light colored feathers. I can't remember which one, but it's wrong to use the other, other color. Uh, the arrows must be kept warm on a fire at all times when they are still potentially active arrows, which doesn't mean you're on a hunt. It means like you know, over this period of time, these are the arrows that are in play. Other ones get get wrapped up and put into the rafters of the of the hut. Some of these rules are important rules, like you know the you know the 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 the, the wood used for the tip, for example. But other rules are at least seems pretty clear, like the, a silly rule: what color the feathers are uh, on the on on the back uh, on on the arrow, um, and Yet, all of these rules about um, all of these rules about uh, how arrows are made are considered tremendously meaningful. So, like the color is interpreted as um, I think they have to be dark. Yeah, not colorful feathers. So dark feathers, perhaps, because colorful feathers are used in religious rituals, and women work with colorful feathers producing artifacts for religious rituals and arrows are, a sim are are about masculinity and so there's this all tons and tons of meaning that's right for these people in this group these are not meaningless at all they don't go around thinking what silly rules we have right they go no these are they've invested these rules with with great meaning um and i think that's true of most of our our silly rules we many most of us do not think that our rules are silly um again i'm using a very define you know a real economic definition of a silly rule not my assessment what a stupid rule why would you have that rule um so i think that that's just going back you know the the idea about meaning is is i think something uh important to look at i did also want to you said you know that it could be signaling uh willingness to comply with rules and i actually think that's 
a, re, a redirection I'd like to make in a lot of this work because there's so much focus on the idea. The hard part is compliance. And so we look at willingness to comply and so on. I don't think compliance is hard at all because if you have an effective enforcement mechanism, compliance is what follows. Again, it's it's it, 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 if you really take seriously the availability of enforcement mechanism, it's I comply because I will be made fun of, I will be criticized, I might be, you know, people won't invite me to the party, they won't do business with me, right? I might ultimately get kicked out of get kicked out of my group. And so I don't think compliance is the thing to explain. I think enforcement is the thing. That's the great puzzle. How do you incentivize and coordinate third party punishment? Why do people who have no business involved in this interaction expend resources to help enforce? Um, and that's actually where this next, or is there, is there somebody else waiting to ask Tara or can I, can I move but on? We, Sile mentioned that uh, he wanted to ask something, but I don't know okay. if you want to ask no, that now, what have we got? We, we still got we still got time, so sure. Uh, yeah, I had a different question, but I, I first want to ask Jillian if meditating on these silly questions, are you have you become less inclined to question things around you? Lest it might start destroying important <laughs> So I guess what I go around saying is silly rules are not silly. I'd say be very, very careful before you destroy all your silly rules. Um, and uh, so, yeah, as well as when I, you know, when I sometimes I'm in conversations about how would we create a new, um, you know, new organizations around AI safety and alignment. And uh, I've been talking about silly rules for a long time now. It's a project that's been on the, on the go for quite some time. And it's like, okay, well, be sure to include silly rules in your set of rules that you want people to comply with, say AI developers to avoid you know, development races of some kind. Um, you know, uh, like have have funny colored hats, have weird things that you do at the beginning of a meeting, have, you know, you know, basically things that will give up because what because the signaling is we're still on board, yes, for compliance, but mostly for enforcement to say these are the things that we do and we will expend the effort to, you know, the uncomfortable thing of saying, I'm sorry, you can't join the meeting until you go get your hat um right because that's you're, you're looking for our commitment to the set of rules so i don't know if that's what you're getting at to hear but yeah yeah definitely but this is really well shattering to me which means it means that we can't really have sane policy discussions like i might say see this rule does not really help with anything and then you might say or someone with these insights might say well it's an important silly rule and then suddenly that's like a get out of jail free card for any existing. Room. Oh, yes. But then but then there's this isn't a anything goes right. There's a lot of part of what I want to do here is see there's a lot of structure and a lot of theory. And if we really had identified it's a silly rule because it has no impact, I say, well, we could choose maybe can, can we choose a different silly rule? Right. So, you know, I've, I've said that the definition of a silly rule is it it has no direct impact on welfare. but Maybe my group is maintaining its silly rules by imposing costs on others. By saying, oh no, we don't allow people of that race, gender, orientation, culture into our group, which, you know, in, in, in some cases might be that that's a silly rule for the from the perspective of that group maintaining the stability of its membership. Um, but it could be quite costly to others. Um, I, but I, I say, Hill, I do think it, it does complicate policy discussions if you're not thinking about, um, uh, you know, if, if we're thinking, oh, we can just focus on the important rules. You say, okay, but maybe you want to make sure they're embedded still in, in environments that have silly rules, which we could change and we could choose different ones. Um, or that's the question. Um, you know, how much can we change them? Anyway, interesting to think about. Yeah, this is definitely very fascinating. Thank you. I also have another unrelated question, but I'll go after everyone else. Zach, did you have a question? 
Um, yeah, so I had a quick clarificatory question that I wanted to follow up with a um, um, more involved question. Um, so did you say that your intuition or perhaps more than just intuition, perhaps you have evidence to, to believe this, um, is that as societies increased in complexity and, and scale that uh, the number, like the quantity of silly rules has decreased? I did. I did say that was a predict. That was a hypothesis I entertain. I don't have okay. evidence about that. I'll just I casually look around. But I. I also could be wrong because hardly anybody's gone and done like the inventory. Right. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, so what I what I was kind of wondering, and I did, I was also just kind of interested in your general thoughts on this. Um, but but now it's this, I have a specific question related to silly rules. Is that um, it seems like you, there's this, uh, so there's research in cultural evolution, you, you might know it uh, better than I do, because this is new to me, um, that, that shows that there's like an informational threshold um, that like once once there's a sort of level of informational complexity in a society, the, the scale of the population can increase. And then like once the scale increases, then this like allows for more informational complexity. And so from my understanding, what this research is sort of identified is that this happened um, pretty much across societies when reading was invented um, and, and, and sort of spread out and particularly when reading and writing was democratized um, because it allows for like increased information channels and it seems like we're seeing that with the internet right the internet allows for like a lot of increased complexity and in information channels between people um, so I'm kind of curious in general like what you what you think about that in relation to your research, but in particular, I, one thing that I was thinking about silly rules is that maybe once you have a more complex society. You actually might have like a more um, a higher quantity of silly rules, but just like a diversity of them, where you have all of these like micro cultures right you know and you think about like Internet culture. Or just like think about like different music cultures, like punk culture, or like rap culture, something like this, or all these different little micro cultures that emerge, like academic culture, or like even just looking at the difference between biologists and computer scientists, or what have you. And so it's almost making me wonder if we actually might see an increase in the quantity of silly rules, but but not universally accepted silly rules. Um, and, and I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot packed in there. There's a lot you could do with with that. But yeah, I'm just. Curious your general thoughts. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so on the first point about um, increasing information and complexity. So um, so uh, so let me just advertise my book um, because like the ma the basic thesis of the book is that human societies inherently become more complex. And I can think about that. You can think about it from an information point of view, but it's, it's, it's an implication of biology, but it's just an implication of economist here specialization and the division of labor if you stabilize a bigger group you grow surplus you get increased specialization and division of labor so it's one of the most fundamental economic insights right that the extent of the um you know the degree of specialization is a function of the size of the uh, uh, of, of the market of the group uh the way i think about it as, as the group increasing specialization increasing division of labor that's increasing diversity of, of participants and introduction of novel behaviors that take the rule set that begins at, you know, start time, time zero, a group comes into existence, it stabilizes with a rule set. And because it is stable, it grows all kinds of novel behaviors. There's innovation, there's growth, there's we move to new, new environments, et cetera. We have new behaviors and now we have ambiguity about the classification of those new behaviors of novel behaviors or behaviors old behaviors in new environments and so the fundamental thesis of the book is that we see the emergence of law defined as a unique centralized classification institution is because you there's a demand for resolution of ambiguity because of that increase in complexity and that it's very it's very to the point right that yeah, and then when you're successful at that, you grow yourself into the next level of complexity. And so that's why I also think we're at a point in human history where we're saying, okay, our existing institutions for doing this work during industrialization, work during the mass manufacturing economy. They are not going to work. They're not working very well already, and they are not responsive to the 
speed, the complexity, the globalization of what we're facing now um, with digital transformation and AI. Um, so it, absolutely that it's about changing. Now your, your hypothesis about, uh, you know, maybe we get more silly rules um, is it, it, what makes that a really interesting research question because you've got two different predictions about what might be happening. And so like investigating that means it would be really valuable. Um, the, uh, uh, it was like I was suggesting in my answer to, I think Sahil earlier, um, one of the ways you can get silly rules is you could be in your group, but you could also have just a bunch of different groups. And so you could have that, like what's a silly rule to me is not a silly rule to you. And I can get silly rules in the community because we just have diversity of individuals. But your point is also a really important one about as societies have grown and become more complex and frankly have gotten better at maintaining normative legal orders, right? Incre so, so what's producing the silly rules? It's uncertainty about the stability of the enforcement regime. As that uh, uh, uncertainty dissipates because we get enough observations, right? The silly rules are less important. In fact, I'm gonna jump to this work, the multi-agent work we're doing where this is one of the problems we have. Once you stabilize it, the silly rules become unimportant because everybody knows everybody knows all behavior. So you kind of need constant shocks happening. Um, and we actually think it's the role for children, um, but we also get that from real immigration, from increased mixing across, across communities. But I think we do, as we become more stable, we do have the capacity for microcultures, as you said, and what we, you know, now we're doing this really complex thing because we're actually in a whole bunch of these things simultaneously, right? You, you just joined the PIBS group, right? They probably got a little culture that's, that's in there that's developing. You have a culture that's in there that's developing. Um, you know, you've got, you've got family, you've got religion, you've got your workplaces, you've got your, you know, your, the, you know, the group you meet up with for DIY music on Friday or something. I mean, it's just, it, you've got all these multiple groups and that's kind of a, an amazing thing about advanced cultures, figuring out how to do that in a stable way. We also see all the pressure that comes in from that. So I, I think this is a really cool direction to, to think about because I also think the future has to involve a lot more of those micro cultures. Like the idea that we're gonna resolve our AI alignment problems by getting global agreement on what the value should be, I just think is silly and dangerous. <laughs> Um, you know, I think we're gonna have to figure out other things. Yeah, okay. cool, thank you. That's really cool. I think, or did you wanna keep going? We might have another question, but. What do you think, Kara? Should I, I, I think I think people would like to see, I'll, I'll try to go do this quite quickly just to, and then we'll get to it. another question. Sure. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, good. Because I wanted to show the sort of the direction we've gone in this work. And this is a paper that was just published in PNAS. Um, and uh, this is with um, Joel um, uh, Adele Lebo and Raphael Custer and others at DeepMind as well as, and, and also with Dylan again. Um, what we did was take this idea of silly rules and put it into a multi-agent reinforcement learning environment. Um, and we really asked those foundational questions. Um, you know, our agents, um, uh, our agents start off totally from scratch. They just, you know, all they, they have to, they recognizing pixels. They have no models of the world. There's no concept of rule. There's no concept of punishment. But if you've seen their work on um, tragedy of the commons and so on, doing really nice work on that sort of with a, you endow your agents with um, a, 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 a capacity to inflict cost punishment on others. They have a punishing beam, but you could think of it as, you know, shaking your finger at somebody or yelling at them. It doesn't have to be actually physically harming them. And so we were interested in the question, will the agents learn to punish, um, uh, learn to avoid punishment? Can we get a stable state with normative infrastructure? How do silly rules affect that? And does normative infrastructure raise payoffs? And the environment we use, and I don't have a picture of it here because this is from a presentation when I usually don't go into a lot of details. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, just a, it's an environment with berries in it, a different colored berries. Um, there's no competition for resources. There's plenty of berries for everybody, uh, but the agents need to learn uh, to eat berries in order that that does them good. Um, one of these berries is a poison berry 
that will uh, reduce health, but with a long delay. So there's a credit assignment problem. So uh, it, takes a, it takes a long time for the health effects of eating the poison berry to show up. And what we look at is three conditions. We look at one condition with, um, oh, so, and then we, sorry, we, we implement the idea of normative infrastructure here um, by having agents who eat, we, we introduce the idea of a taboo. Again, the agents don't get a model of a taboo, but we are imposing that structure. We're saying, here's how we're gonna implement a taboo. Um, uh, I think it's the, the green berries are the poisonous ones. If you eat a green berry, an agent will become marked in the view of other agents. That's a bit like some, it's a social construction. Others see that you've done something you're not supposed to do because the poison berry is taboo. And agents have this punishing beam they can use. And if they punish, it's costly to use it. It imposes a cost on the punisher and a cost on the, the recipient of the punishment. Um, but if an, if an agent punishes a marked agent, an agent who has violated a taboo, there's a, there's, a, there's a reward to that punishment. Okay, so that's the only case in which being rewarded matters. So we look at three conditions. There's no rules at all, no taboos. We look at a world where there's just the important rule, which would say, don't eat poison berries, and the rest of us are gonna you know, thump you on the head if you do. And a rule where there's a, a, rule, a, a rule against eating the poisonous berry, but then a rule against eating a harmless berry. And don't eat the purple ones either even though the purple ones are harmless. Again, none of the agents know this. Um, and what we're able to show is these agents, um, uh, so I think the picture to look at just first here is the one on the lower right, the uh, panel F. This is the collective reward to the group. Uh, the yellow line is, there's no, nothing is, um, there's no uh, punishment at all, no taboos. Red is the important rule condition, just the poisonous berry is taboo and green is the uh, silly rule condition, the poisonous berry is taboo, and a harmless berry is also taboo. And what you can see with that green line for collective return, it's, it's steps of training along the uh, horizontal axis um, and uh, return um, uh, on the vertical axis, of course. You can see that green line above the, the red line there, uh, particularly through the middle sections. Um, that's the hot, there's higher, higher return, even though we have more taboo berries, and even though there's more punishment that initially happens, um, you get higher collective return because that silly rule is giving those agents, these agents have to learn. First, they learn to, and I don't think I have the time, there's, there's, there's some uh, plots in the paper that will show you that the first thing the agents learn to do is to enforce the rule. Then they learn to comply. Why did they comply? Because they get zapped if they eat the, the berries that get them marked, and they learn they learn that. But that they can't learn that until the stable, until enforcement behaviors have been learned. Um, and you can you can see that here in some of these in some of these pictures as well. Um, with you can see in that. Let me see. It's my screen is covering this up. Yeah, the total times punished in the panel B. You can see that initially there's a lot more punishing that's happening in the world with silly rules, the green, um, but eventually it drops below uh, the amount of punishing that's happening in the, uh, the world with just the important rule. And that's because agents in the silly rule condition learn to enforce and therefore learn to comply faster with the rules. And the benefit here is you support the rule against eating poisonous berries, which helps everybody, which helps all the individual agents um, and you do that, you do that faster and more stably uh, with the silly rule there. And the, the fact if you, uh, if you look at the thick like panel D, total time since poisoning, this amount of like, you can see that the yellow condition with no rules, the agents never learn to avoid the poisonous berry. The credit assignment problem is too hard. Um, so um, the, uh, the insights here, normative behaviors are supporting better choices, silly rules are supporting learning of normative behaviors, enforcement and compliance. And, and then this is my dig at using game theoretic approaches, even though game theory has, has long been my thing. Um, game theoretic approaches to predicting and explaining this will not capture this phenomenon and therefore miss something important. Okay, and, and I'm done. So we've got another few minutes still for questions. Um. Thanks, Julian. Um, I think I saw a question from Shim. Um, so maybe we'll start with that. 
Uh, cool. Thanks so much, uh, Julian, for I think the really fascinating talk. And I think, sorry, I didn't mean to make sure my mic is pointing. Um, yeah, I think I've seen like some or, some very work. I mean, I, I think you know this this research agenda of like building AI systems that uh, you know try and participate in this the normative social order seems like exactly right to me. And I think you know that's because you know at least in the near to medium term we should be expecting to build like you know AI systems that sort of you know play particular social institutional roles in in society right you know might have ai personal assistance which might have different like norms they have to follow from like ai that's you know performing certain kinds of roles of like public justice say in like you know sen sentencing or judgments or whatever like bail, bail judgments um and and so I, I can see like why it's so important in this like set of research projects you outlined to build systems that attempt to sort of infer or learn the existing you know, normative social order, or, or, um, right? Um, but but I guess if, I'm curious. You know, it seems to me like one. You know, if you stop, if we stop at just you know, tr building agents that just learn, you know, the actually existing rules by which society governs itself right now, then we we run into like you know, the problem of like conventionalism, where the rules that we actually have right now, and and consequently the ones that the AI systems follow are bad or, or like suboptimal in some way for the things we actually want in, as, a, as a society, you know, you know, despite the fact that we have competing values. Um, and, and I think also you have, and, you know, you also have this, I think, related problem of like a lot of actually existing rules, whether it's in law or other social contexts being like, you know, as, as you've mentioned, like ambiguous or, you know, sometimes overdetermined, uh, sometimes like in present, but not enforced, you know, um, and I, I it seems to me like one solution to that problem or one like technical challenge then for building artificial agents uh, that are sort of norm compliant is not just like learning the actually existing rules, but learning to extrapolate them or resolving conflicts between existing rules. Um, and there I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, you didn't say much about like how this relates to the human moral cognition or, 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 or ethical reasoning. But it seems to me that that's partly what what we do in those contexts, right? Like when we, you know, think that there is like a rule which is bad, we try to like think, oh, what's the spirit of the rule or spirit of the law behind that, and like try to, you know, or or when something is sort of not, you know, the contract is incomplete. I think there's so we have certain meta norms for resolving those situations, but I think also like in in in, gen, in cases where we are generally don't have like rules set out, we like try to see well, what was the function of the rule in the first place, and like trying to like you know, figure out like what would be the best thing to do in the context of like satisfy that function, right? And I'm curious, you know, I mean, curious what you think of that, like as a sort of like important part of, of I guess, this research agenda and like, um, yeah, and any other thoughts, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Lots of lots of great uh, uh, parts to that question there, Shan. And and I do know, I think you're referring to this Sydney Levine's work and with Josh Tenenbaum and others on on moral cognition. I tend to steer away from uh, that framework. Um, I mean, I think it's, I, I'm really interested in the cognitive architecture. I think that's a critical question, but I think the framework of uh, my critique of all of our approaches or other approaches on this is that they look at the level of the norm, number one. And two, I think the moral reasoning literature um, focuses on the idea that, you know, it's, it's all this internal reasoning that humans do. And that it's this, you know, that we, we, we do this reasoning and morals evolve, you know, emerge from uh, and our, you know, moral behavior is governed by our reasoning about the morals, the more, more you know, moral principles. So like the idea of looking behind the rule for the function, I've seen you know, like the work on, you know, is this a case in which you can cut the line for the cookies or whatever. Um, and, and I think that is missing the massive amounts of infrastructure in place. So first of all, I actually think that moral reasoning plays a very limited role in our normative social order. Um, we don't, I mean, so there's a lot of structure to the answer, to how we answer the question of can you cut the line, right? So if it really was, if it was a, if it was, if it was your, uh, if it was your classroom, it's a teacher who resolves that you may do the reasoning, but there's going to be an answer to the question, is it okay to cut the line? And it's going to be the group that's going to respond and, uh, pro and a teacher who's often in a position, or if it's in a, a workplace, 
right? There'll be a, you know, might be a rule, but there'll be also be social norms around that. So I think I, I don't want to, I, I think we don't want to get too stuck inside. It's a little bit like don't get stuck inside the game theoretic box. Don't get stuck inside the individual brain doing something called moral reasoning. That's a part, I actually think moral reasoning is a part of the infrastructure, right? It, we actually have, we, we put that into our institutions and we do use it, but less interested in the moral reasoning. And, and, and if it was that purpose is the right thing, that's not because that's, that's given to us in the environment, it's because that's given to us by our normative infrastructure as how should I anticipate the way my community would label uh, cutting in line I should engage in reasoning about the purpose of the rule. And that gives me a good prediction because that's the that's the infrastructure that I'm in. So I, I want to sort of emphasize that difference. Again, I don't mean to diss the moral cognition work. I think I just want to I say, okay, but let's get it up to the level of cognition about what the rules are. And this is why also the your first point about conventionalism, I want to take a different tack on that one. Um, it's a little bit like when um Tomash mentioned uh, you know, learn, you know predicting who will comply. This We have been very, very focused in this line of work on uh, the individual norms and compliance behavior. And I'm sort of key messages are pay attention to the meta structure, pay attention to the, because the thing that is valuable about normativity is its plasticity, is its capacity for changing content and remaining stable. That's what makes it an enormously valuable tool that we've invented, structure that we've invented. And we're not selecting at the level of the norm. So when we say, when I say we want to build agents that can participate in normative infrastructure, that is not the same as saying they can go out and observe behavior and say, that's what I should do. What I want them to observe is what gets you punished in this community and who decides what changes and how are, is uncertainty about what is a punishable action resolved and paying attention to alertness to where that decision making is coming from so it, it and there's there's lots of other reasons to say we shouldn't train on like our history of criminal justice decisions right but that's also just a very like that's just a boneheaded thing to be doing to be training machine learning systems to exercise normative judgment by just oh just go look at the decisions we made in the past we know that's a that, that's just a crummy training procedure. Like, okay, we got to figure out how to create those idealized. We want to implement our ideals of how we, and 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 where do those ideals come from? They come from our legitimate political institutions. They don't come from an artificial agent that says, "Oh, sorry, did the math. Here's what comes out." Right? That's that's thinking very different. You have to think about that normative infrastructure you're going to create around AI systems that start to exercise judgment in the world. Right, and you've got to train those machines to be responsive to that normative infrastructure you've created for that. Right, so so I think there's um, so I'm, I I totally agree with the critique that says you don't just want to train machines to go observe human behavior and and mimic it because then we get tie or whatever you know you get your tay or or right you know just uh, uh, you know thoughtlessly replicating um, human behavior. I mean, it would be kind of stupid if you think you're building uh, agents that are more intelligent, that can be more intelligent than humans. Well, this is fundamental piece of, this is why I say, go back to the very beginning of the talk, right? Cooperative intelligence is fundamental to human intelligence. It's not that like you can build intelligence, which is task completion and optimization, and then to say, okay, now how do we direct those agents to be cooperative? We did not emerge without fundamental capacity for uh, cooperation with others, which means it's not preferences about what rules I like. It's not preferences about what behaviors I like. Those are constraint on the system. Those can be factors, although a lot of my preferences come from the environment and the group. Um, but it's, it's you really want to shift that level at which we're analyzed. So again, training agents, building agents that can participate and be competent normative actors is much more complex and more and richer than what norms should we stuff into them and where should they get the norms that they follow? Right, I think I'm, I'm very much on board with that picture. And 
and I, I think perhaps we don't, you know, that the, the sort of the thing I was pointing, alluding towards with like moral cognition isn't isn't so different from that. Because the way, you know, I think we should be trying to learn this like meta structure, the higher level structure, like not existing rules. But the way I like to think of it is like we need to learn like, you know, AI, AI systems, we need to learn like the generative process like that explains why these particular rules are instantiated in this particular society, right? And I think that involves like knowing things like how the law works and stuff like that, and you know, in legal in, in legal societies and stuff like that. But then I think in that context, then I think, and this is maybe just empirical hypothesis, that um, which is that it seems to me that part, an important part of the generative process that like explains why we come to have the rules that we do have today is something like moral reasoning, and you could call it something more general like norm, normative reasoning. But uh, when I think about like you know, an AI that tries to like predict what a set of judges would do and the kinds of reasons it would appeal to, you know, that looks a lot like, you know, what we, you know, it's not exactly the same as, but I think it looks very similar to certain forms of like moral reasoning. Uh, and I think the moral reasoning part maybe comes, becomes more applicable in like less legal context where, you know, your the AI systems to predict, you know, what would, what, what, what would a person do if like, you know, what does it mean to be a good friend? You know, what, what, like, would this person like sanction me if I like was a jerk or something like that? Um, and 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 and, and I, I don't know whether that sort of that connection strikes you as like plausible versus like still misguided. Um. So so I think it's, so. I I still want to emphasize that moral reasoning how is is playing a a. a that that there's a very very so if we think about our classification institutions okay and not okay pure moral reasoning from whatever tradition in our societies is is only playing a, a limited role in that there's a very limited set of decisions that have now been left to that kind of decision making and um uh if you wanted to so but but the 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 structure of normative reasoning and moral reasoning is a form of normative reasoning it's reasoning about shoulds it's it's the giving of reason. So the piece of moral theory that I really like, sort of the legal theory, moral theory, is the idea of accounts and reasons and the, the assessment of what is a good reason. That is itself the subject of normative structure, right? I teach law, right? I teach people how to engage in this kind of reason giving, reason assessment, reason evaluation. And you know, if you're going to predict what judges say, that you absolutely you, you engage in learning about what reasons will this side give, what reasons will that side give, what reasons would a hypothetical, Herculean, neutral, following the principles of our entire normative infrastructure, that legal infrastructure, what decision might they come to in looking at those reasons, and. Um, so I think getting good at that. Now, what we all I can also tell you about legal reasoning is it involves tons and tons of procedural stuff, right? Uh, well, that may be what you moral you reason to about same sex marriage, but here's what here's how we approach decision making in the Constitution. And there's a bunch of us that think you just look at quote unquote text and history, and others who think you look at concepts of of you know uh, other moral interests or dignity interests or liberal theory interests. And then we've got a process say, so, oh, we appointed judges in this way. And there's now six of those who think that way and three that think this way. And that's how it gets classified in the society from a legal point of view. So, but I think there's so much in here. It's, it's really rich. And, and uh, I, I don't intend my, my caution about moral reasoning and moral cognition to, to say that's not important. I just say, okay, but let's, 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 let's think um, uh, more ambitiously perhaps about how it, how it functions here. Just want to uh, flag that we are now at the end of our time. Um, and I want to see first, anyone who needs to leave, uh, this would be <laughs> a good moment. Norm setting, that. norm setting, norm announcing. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. And I don't want to keep anyone who, who only has this long. And also Jillian, uh, you mentioned that you have until about now. Um, so I want to check, do you have time for one more question or uh, do you need to go? I am just going to double check my calendar. Uh, sure, I can take your last couple of questions. I'm really enjoying this and very, um, very interested in in spurring more work on these topics. So wonderful. Um, then I think Sahil is the next person with a question. Yeah. So one of <clears throat> I'm I'm just like trying to really pay attention to 
yeah cooperative foundations maybe one of the reasons or even the main reason that i'm interested in this is to go really really low and to just look at cooperation as agency my personal agency itself being just a cooperation between myself and future selves so like you use the example of uh, you get the example of language not norm setting predating language uh, and then i think about an internal language that i have to use as an agent alone like when i invent a new symbol for a concept and then i hand it off to my future self and i'm wondering if there's any insights from these group settings to form a potential foundation of individual agency is that something that you've thought about um i guess i'm i want to know whether the current agent and the future agent is embedded in a group right which i i think there's no such thing as a human not embedded in a group so if, is is or and yeah well just the way that you might talk about uh groups of humans being always embedded in larger groups perhaps but you could still talk about like you could talk about uh two cultures in in a country and you could still yeah. talk about the interactions between the two cultures so in the same way maybe an individual is embedded in a group but the individual is a group itself of the various selves across time so i'm wondering if we could apply similar principles yeah i i i think what you need is so it's very hard for me to think about normativity without multi that it's an inherently multi agent setting and that's partly coming from third party enforcement so i think normativity only arises with humans in this sense of third party enforcement we can we have normativity well i should i should put that differently there's there's normativity in in lots of species and agents and actually a colleague of mine at, at UT Dennis Walsh is 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 a biologist uh, and a philosopher um and and thinks about this in in other organisms and and you can have normativity in the sense of you know this is a good action to take this is not a good action to take this will promote um fitness this one won't um but the normativity that I'm thinking about here, the idea of norms is with third party enforcement. So it's hard for me to think about putting cooperation, me and my person, individual self in the future. And that, that still seems to me um, well explained by um, our, in, you know, yeah. So probably well explained by not even thinking about this. It's still normative, but not cooperative norms. Um, because I now now I do think that a lot of our individual behavior is is you know Adam Smith talks about the impartial spectator, and Shen was here. We talked about moral reasoning earlier, and that's his interpretation of what morality is. Is actually you you're in, engaged in an internal conversation between yourself and the impartial spectator, like you're querying the impartial. What would an impartial spectator think of my behavior? And that's a representation of the group to me. Right, that's a prediction about a representation of how would the group evaluate this behavior. So I also don't think there's very much that can go on in our heads that doesn't involve that. So, so maybe that would be a way of thinking about me and my so, future self and cooperative. So, so just to clarify, the main reasons you're not really you don't think that's a fruitful line is because temporal selves don't really afford a third party, and also because individual reasoning is. To embed it in the group to really go down to this level, something like that. Yes, I think that's right. I think those are the two parts of my my answer there. I mean, I'd be interested to think more about it, but that that's my first thought. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Last question. Anson. Oh no, you're not Anson. Probably you're somebody else. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Yes. I'm. A, I'm just about the only one here, so I think this is definitely the last question. Um. My my question is, so the cultural aspects of your work, how do you relate them or think they relate to other kind of theories that will try to classify cultures? Like um, I'm thinking of Michelle Gelfand's theory on like tightness versus looseness of cultures, which it kind of says is a second dimension compared to like individualistic versus collectivist. Um, can you think of this these two dimensions, which is like the amount of silly rules and the degree of enforcement as being like 
a decomposition of this into two different axes and the learning systems to be kind of like an explanation for how you find the optimal setting or is that kind of the wrong way to look at what you're trying yeah, to Yeah, no, actually we, in, in the PNAS paper, in the PNAS paper, we talk a little bit about the tightness, looseness literature and how it relates and, and to say so that, that it, in our framework, we would be using, you know, we, we're suggesting you could also use the concept of looking at um, silly rules and, you know, the density of silly rules and the infrastructure of enforcement um, uh, to think about those differences. Um, I think, you know, my, you know, a constant theme for me is just to keep hounding on this idea of you need this, we call this work micro foundations. And, and that's like the economic bent was to say, look, I don't want I want to, I don't want to put anything into my theory that is the thing I'm trying to explain. So I, I if I want to explain cultures, I don't want to assume, well, there's an A culture and a B culture. And it, it has these, and I observe, it's tight in this one and it's loose in that one. So I'll say there are two types of cultures, tight and loose. I haven't explained anything when I do that. Um, it, it's why I don't like a lot of behavioral economics because I'm trying to explain you know, instincts to altruism or fairness. And so I don't want to say, well, we ran these experiments and there are two types of people in the world. There are those who like to punish and those are those who don't. That's why I didn't like the, you know, we, we used that set up in the first paper, but it, I sort of flagged that this is, this is a methodological choice for a project like this. And ultimately we want to do like what we're doing in the multi-agent work, which is, okay, start with nothing. Can you build up these characteristics? Can you build up these features? What, 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 what affordances in the environment do you need to put in? So we only put in the affordance of you. Others can observe when you violate something that this environment has said is a, a norm. Now, next thing would be, okay, where do those norms come from? That would be the next step in this work. And we hope it is the next step in this work. Um, and they have the affordance of delivering punishment um, and getting rewarded. That's, that's incentivizing. Again, the next step in the work would be, okay, how do you create that incentive? Um, uh, without without hardwiring it, um, but we're not. I don't. I don't like to start off with the idea of classifying cultures. I think we're trying to explain culture. You can't start with a classification of cultures. This I don't like that type of theorizing, right? So it's it's, it's this is where I have always been an economist methodologically. There's lots of economics that I don't like and I'm not interested in, but uh, and I certainly don't think the model of the utility maximizing selfish individual is anything like a picture of what it would be like if I just grabbed, you know, somebody out of the population and said, okay, right. But it's a powerful methodological tool. Like I said, say my behavioral economics probably will help me predict very well how a group of people that I assembled in an environment tomorrow in this particular place would play this particular game. It's going to give me great predictions about that don't think it's going to give me great predictions about what kinds of behaviors and institutions have been stable over time, will be stable. And as we face real disruption to the nature of strategic interaction and, and, perform, and, and cooperation with artificial agents, I want something that's, you know, really, really, really minimalistic to start with and build from there. So anyway, there's discussion of that. Uh, tightness, looseness, a little bit. And I think it's in there. I think it's, it it survived the last edit. So, yeah, I I got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so okay. much. It was it was a great great talk. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jillian. It's been a pleasure having you here. Great. And it it's was a really a illuminating talk. Wonderful, wonderful, good. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more about what everybody gets up to. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.